This is episode number 24 of DevOps Paradox with Darren Pope and Victor Farsik. I am Darren. And I'm Victor. We were talking about what we were going to talk about today. So we're being meta before we're being meta. And we decided to talk about deployment strategies. That's something Victor has been playing with a lot recently. Let's first depl- decline, define, <laughs> at the time of this recording, I have been up three and a half hours, but, or excuse me, let me rephrase that, two and a half hours, but still doesn't mean I can talk. Let's define what deployment strategies are. Basically, there are two types of deployment strategy, important types, and that's those that create downtime and those that don't. And most of you listening are deploying things with downtime. Um, because, and, and the reason for that is not that much in a strategy, but because of the architecture of your applications. I cannot, most applications these days cannot scale up. And if you cannot scale up, there is nothing in the world that can make you deploy new release without downtime. Simply because if you cannot have multiple replicas, then one needs to be shut down and another one needs to be put in its place. And between shut it down and putting something in its place, it's a downtime, a millisecond or a week. You choose, but there is always a downtime, right? And then if you're talking about deployments that do, can be done without downtime, they're all turning around some kind of rolling updates. And my favorite subject of all time, blue-green. Whenever I hear blue-green, I want to open a door and run away. Why? Because why do you why do you want to run away? Because it's the most commonly asked thing. Whenever I speak about those things, the first thing that the first question is always, "Can we do blue green?" Kind of like, why? Why do you want blue green? I don't really understand why. First of all, you most likely cannot do it because if you can, you would be doing it already. And uh, second is that there are so many problems with blue green deployments that. But it simply it's so popular that everybody wants it. What do you what do you, well, hang on a second? I'm gonna stop you there. What are some of the problems that you see with blue green? To begin with, if you're running something on scale, do you really think it's a good idea to duplicate your capacity, your infrastructure, so that you can deploy? Because blue green assumes that you're running blue and green at the same time. It's not blue and then green they're running at the same time so let's say that you're you're medium to big size right and let's say that you have you need 10 nodes to run your application to say something right for some people that's too much but actually any any decently sized company has that volume right so 10 nodes means that you need 20. and what if you're google size or netflix size are you gonna hundreds of nodes are going to be multiplied to by two. That's simply not cost effective. It's too expensive. Okay, let me push back on this for just a second. Is this our first fight? Oh, yeah. Do we get, let's make it, a, do we get, to, do we get to cuddle at the end? We never um, fought before. Yeah, let's do it. So I'm, 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 not, I'm not fighting hard on the pure on double all the time. Right? That's stupid. I'll, I'll go with that. But what about blue green from a, I'm going to air quote, dynamic perspective? I've been running all along and now I'm ready to do my, do my green. So I spin up green maybe a day or two in advance. And then once I'm happy with green going live, a day or two after green has been blessed as all good, then blue dies. But uh, how what, do you know? How how do you? How, what makes you happy? Are you letting your users use both blue and green? No. Are you kind of verifying yourself? You mean whether it works fine? Um, okay, so let me rephrase that. Yes, it would be users. W- once we flip the switch from from blue to green, mm-hmm. all traffic has been bled off to green, mm-hmm. and everything's green. And we run in green for a couple of days, or whatever the the magic time is. Mm-hmm but it can't be more than a couple of days. A couple of days meaning probably two to four, something less than a week. Mm -hmm. So just- And then if if everything is good and nothing has gone horribly bad, then blue gets destroyed. 
Okay, so you're keeping blue or whichever is the color of the old release yeah. as a way to fall back. As a just in case, very, very near term. Yes. So, and uh, is that a reasonable blue green strategy? So, for the sake of argument, uh, in this example, is it, uh, are you running Kubernetes or VMs? No, VMs. VMs, okay. So, uh, how much does it take to spin up the VM with the old release? A minute? Mm, five? Mm, five? Less than 10. Less than 10. So, is it three days just for the sake of being able to roll back? Does it justify? It's, it's, it's three days to be able to switch back the DNS entry to, to the load balancer of the blue side. Yeah, but you could just as well shut down blue and create it again. Ab- absolutely, we could. Yeah. So, basically, you're multiplying, duplicating your cost for, for the sake to avoid... A couple of days. 10 minutes, right? Yes. Okay, so f- fair enough. Maybe I wouldn't go two to four days, but maybe a day, right? Just just in case I'm waiting, especially if I did it on a weekend. If I did a Saturday blue-green, which would be stupid. Yeah. I mean, I understand that, but if, if it's... So there are other arguments to keep it running, but if it's for the reason of rolling back, you can just as well stop the machine. If 10 minutes is not fast enough, you can stop the machine and start it in then five, right? So kind of rolling back is not really, a, to me, reason good enough. Okay. Uh, what is a reason good enough is if you would be me- letting your users and say, okay, maybe 10% can go to blue and then 90 to green, and then I can see how they behave. And then depending on that behavior, I choose what to do next. But then it's not blue green deployment anymore. That's, right. Then it's canary That's deployment. Canary. Yeah. So okay. what? So what let's, really let's, let's stop. Okay. Keep, let's let's. So did we really fight? Do we really have a fight? No, you said I, I said no, and you said yeah. Okay, okay, I agree. That wasn't a big of a fight. <laughs> no, oh crap! I can't even fight right. Um, all right, so keep keep going. Yeah, so That's, so blue green is in in general done done poorly is bad. Yes, because what what I think that uh, blue green is very significant because it it was the first popularized idea in that direction, uh, and it paved the way for things that make a bit more sense. Uh, so if I put blue-green in a bucket of rolling updates one way or another, uh, then its significance is more because it was a pioneer of, of a direction than because it is that useful today. Right. The it same way for a great, example... It was a great place to start. Exactly. Because the, we had nothing else. The same way as Mesos. Mesos is not when people say Mesos is bad. No, it's not bad. It's just that it's the first used, I mean, publicly used scheduler. And uh, it defined but a lot of the principles that we use today in, in other schedulers like Kubernetes or, or Swarm and so on and so forth. But that does not mean that we should use it. We shouldn't uh, because it's it's timed out. It's the first one to start something. And it's, of course, almost every pioneer in something is bound to die and pave the way for improvements later on. And that's how I see blue-green. Yeah. You, you just said the S word. Did I say the S word? Yeah, swarm. Ah, swarm. <laughs> okay, yes, yes, yes. Uh, we should speak about swarm as well. And then I might get kicked out out of Docker Captain's okay, program. Let's, let's not let's not do that yet. It's um, okay. I am always saying t- telling whatever I mean, no matter where I belong. I know, but so it, so it is interesting you bring up Mesos because at the time it was the leader. Yes, it was the most stable thing. Much yes. like blue green was the best thing at the time. Mesos was the best thing at the time. Yes. Swarm but- at some point was the best thing at the time. Yes, yes, it was. So Swarm came after Mesos and uh, did things much better to begin with. It's much faster, much uses much less resources. The the, the logic behind it is... Uh, now, the logic, unlike other cases, uh, it's kind of... It's not that much evolution of Mesos. I think that to that aspect, Kubernetes is closer. But let, let's say that Mesos did a couple of other mistakes that killed it. Okay. 
Sure. Well, it's sort of like Betamax and VHS. Yes. Or UHD and Blu-ray. It's it, it may be a superior thing, but it didn't get market share. Exactly. It actually, I never thought about it that way, but that's a good analogy. I think that for 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 Docker situation, at least on a scheduler front, uh, it never really attracted industry to expand it. And then it, it stayed only in the hands of Docker as a company, and that meant insufficient adoption. And the results are what they are. Where they are today. Yeah, and that's okay. I mean, are, if, if I was to bet Docker versus Google from an adoption standpoint, who would I pick? If I, if, if I, if I have the belief that I need to run at scale. Oh, yeah, you're going to pick Google. But it, that's but it's a wrong question. It's a completely wrong question. So it it was never really uh, Docker against Google. It was uh, Google, Red Hat, Microsoft, uh, AWS, uh, in CloudBees, just to mention our company, and everybody else against Docker. And that's Beta Betamax and then VHS situation as well. It's in Betamax. It was Sony against everybody else. And everybody else won, uh, which is rectified now partly with Google and stuff, uh, by Docker and stuff like that. But that's a separate story. But yes, adoption is huge. Of course. So, all right. So so we, we rabbit trailed already. Um, blue green. Uh-huh. What are your other strategies that, okay, so blue green probably was the most logical thing, especially from a VM perspective. Yes. Right. It, to, to begin with, I mean, it was it was what it was, and unfortunately for most people, that might still be where they are today, because they're not to any kind of scheduled platform. No, I think that for most people is where, where they're striving to get. Oh, still. Yeah. Okay. I don't think that yeah. most people are there. Most people You're are correct. trailing behind. Yeah. But so th- th- this is how I see evolution, and I'm now really improvising because I haven't thought this through. It just came to my mind. Uh, you should. You should have no de- no downtime uh, deployment strategy, one way or another. And a uh, few guys, Martin Fowler being the most local about it, comes with Blue Green and says, look, we're going to run Blue, that's your old release, and then we're going to spin up Green, and that's your new release, and we're going to run both of them in parallel because some new request needs to go to the new release and some old request needs to be ter- terminated in the old release. And... The rolling back is an added benefit. I don't think that's the real deal. It's an added benefit. But the point is, switch all new requests to release two, terminate all requests uh, on release one, and only then shut down release one. That's my interpretation of it. Rolling back, if you keep it running, that's that's additional bonus. Uh, while before that, what we were doing is stop my application, put the new release in its place, start it, and be happy ever after. Now, between the beginning and the end of the story, we have downtime. And then again, some others came and said, this, this is great, Blue Green is great. Uh, how about something that maybe, I think Net, Net, Netflix probably popularized it, I don't know who came, but let's do Canary. Let's, let's, uh, let's admit that we have, uh, sorry, before Canaries, let's do rolling updates and say, look, I have, I'm running at scale. I have hundreds of replicas of something. I cannot duplicate that. So I'm going to r- gradually roll out and replace one replica at a time from the old release to a new. So I always have operational application running and I can always, uh, so if I have 50 replicas or let's say 10 replicas, make it modest, then when I shut down the old one replica of the old release, I have nine running. And then I have 10 again. So I'm switching between 9 and 10, but I never have downtime. And then we got into into more complicated things like canary canary deployments, which where I where I would be switching users depending and monitoring uh, uh, traffic and doing some testing and exploration and uh, gets more and more complicated. But it all boils down, I think, on if you, if you run more than one replica, you want to roll out replicas one at a time or maybe portion at a time. And now comes the key part. If you only have one replica, most likely you have only one replica 
uh, because you cannot your application cannot run multiple replicas at the same time, cannot share state or what's or not. And then we come to the key thing. If you run only one replica, then blue green would be good idea for you. But if you cannot scale up, if you cannot run multiple replicas, then physically you're unable to run blue green because at one point blue and green will be running in parallel. Okay. Yes. Now what? Fight me. Say I'm wrong. Okay, hang on a second. Let me get let me get loosened up for this. You're wrong. Why? Well, you just told me to say you were wrong. I, I don't know uh, why okay, yet. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, no, it's that it seems reasonable. But let's go with the single replica for just a second. Mm-hmm. There are applications that should be considered to be a single replica. Yep. I mean, they, they should. There should not be two of them running yes. ever at any point in time. Yes. So, how do you achieve zero downtime? And we're de- and, and for the sake of zero downtime, we mean zero downtime, not even a nanosecond of downtime. It's physically impossible. Okay. Because if you, if you cannot run two replicas, one needs to be shut down before a new one is put, is put in its place, right? Mm-hmm. No matter which process we use, no matter the technology, if you cannot run two at a time, the only way to guarantee that two are not running at the same time is to shut down one and then put the new one in its place. And that, no matter how, that takes some time. There is a period of time between shutting down and being shut down and a new one running in its place. So it is, whether, that, whether that's one millisecond or 100 minutes. Yeah, we, so we can make sure that that's short, as short as possible. We can maybe start and that kind of some semi blue green can come into play. We can say, okay, we can start uh, a new replica without forwarding any traffic, without sharing state or whatever we need to do. But at one moment, we will need to shut shut the traffic if not the application we need to shut the traffic to the old one and start redirecting to the new one and if we shut the traffic we are going to lose existing requests right or we need to say okay no more new requests to the old release but i'm going to finish processing those that are already there but then i'm i'm having downtime because no new requests are coming i would need to come up with some kind of queuing mechanism to avoid that, to queue all those requests and then start forwarding them to the new release only after the old one is shut down. And that means only after the existing requests are processed. So maybe with a queuing, we could do it. Yeah, but if you're making, if people, if those requests coming in were synchronous, they're toast. Yeah, it's 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 never going to fully work. It's, it's simply impossible. I, I cannot imagine a way no matter the technology, how we can avoid downtime without running at least two replicas at the same time. So that goes back to the basics of application development. The yes. deployment strategies that you that you feel like you're stuck with today are all dependent upon the actual way the application was developed. Yes, correct. If, if it doesn't support scaling, it cannot be deployed without downtime. And, and this is now we're going back to some subjects that we were exploring before. This is now that discrepancy that maybe I as a developer, I'm not aware of that at all because I'm not deploying it. I'm not scaling it. I, I don't know what those guys in operations are doing or what says admins or whatever they are. Nobody told me and it's been five years and now you're telling me and it's, man, it's too late. I cannot redo the whole application in a month. So that means and this. This is like old arguments. I mean, this feels like an old Jordan book that I read years ago. I think it was Jordan or Demarco, one or the other. Again, I'm showing my age. Of you need to shift operational constraints into the development process. Yes. You just you gotta know. 
it's it's about and it's and it's not I'm really I'm repeating myself but I'm not saying that everybody should know everything that's impossible that's silly that is not going to happen but you need to be aware of high level requirements of the whole process and deployment is one of them and uh, if 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 there if a company would come up with a re- list of requirements for application non functional requirements not those by the users then one of them must be the application must be scalable. Even if you tell me that with one replica, you can handle any load that you need, still it needs to scale to avoid downtime in deployments, to, to avoid what is happening when the node goes down, and, and quite a few other things. It's a requirement. Scalability is a requirement. But there is a cost to scalability. There, because you have to take that because it's a development cost. I mean, I, I had a side client years ago. It's like, look, I cannot have any downtime at all. This was like a survey type application. Mm-hmm. Cannot have any downtime at all. My budget for running this every month is twenty five dollars. I went, well, you're not going to get that. You can't guarantee that. Yes, it, I mean that it was early two thousands, right? You really couldn't guarantee it back then. So we need to guarantee as a minimum, and this is bad, don't ever try to do that, but you need to run at least two VMs uh, in two different zones if you don't want to avoid any downtime because one data center goes down, the other one needs to take uh, all the load immediately. Yeah. Right? So so you cannot... But that's normal. That's if I can tell you also, you know, I would like to have... Uh, I have... Uh, 5,000 bucks, uh, I would like to have uh, Tesla because, no, not Tesla, give me whatever you want, but it needs to be electric and it needs to park by itself and so on and so forth. So if you don't have means to accomplish everything, you need to figure out what matters most. If it's budget, then you say, you know, keeping it cheap uh, is worth more to me than uh, having downtime. That's a valid assumption. I have nothing against that. As long as you're not unrealistic and say, I want it all, because you're never going to get all. Yeah, it's, it's the three things. I want it cheap, I want it fast, and I want it right. Pick two. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Something gonna is get... going to suffer. Yeah. The um, We've gone way, way off. So deployment strategies. We said blue-green. This, this is nothing. If you've listened to us before, this is nothing new. Blue green, canary. But now what? What's 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 truly next, or what is? Let me let me rephrase that. What's now? The now what we are now. I think that next after canaries is serverless, but not as something you know. Same like with canaries. It's not going to be everything is deployed as canary because the world was not created today. So some things are going to be a big bang strategy, shut it down, put, and then we're going to have some, some things are going to be rolling updates. Uh, a canary being a flavor of it. I, I like, actually, I like the expression from Carlos, our ex colleague, progressive delivery, progressive deployment, which can be canary or this or that, many different things. And then we have serverless, which would be, the next thing, the next thing that will not replace everything, but it is very attractive for many use cases. Where where do you find? I, I have my opinions about serverless, mm-hmm. and I, I'm generally in the pro camp on it. I have there's a few negatives, but what do you find attractive, and what do you find completely ugly about serverless? Attractive is uh, simplicity from development point of view. You know, I have this code. Uh, I push it somewhere and uh, my application just works. It scales up, scales down. Uh, it Actually, it's not even scales up or down, but from developer perspective, my application just works. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know. Maybe it's scaling up. Maybe it's scaling down. Maybe one replica is handling thousands of requests. Maybe I have thousands, uh, one replica for each request. I don't really care. It's there. It works. It's great. Uh, it makes my life easier and everything that makes my life easier without inducing cost to others is a great thing. Uh, what I don't like about serverless first, the, the whole idea about being a function, I think it's unrealistic. 
uh, I don't see maybe in some future, but in any near future, I cannot see how we can cons have considerable amount of what we do defined as functions. I think it's maybe too small, unrealistically small. And I don't like that serverless today is mostly in hands of uh, cloud providers. Uh, and I don't like them holding me by the word I'm not going to use so that you don't mark it as explicit. Okay, fair enough. I, I tend to agree with it. Uh, the, the, the things that can be functions, if, if you can decompose your application down to just functions, I mean, that's really what you need to do in order to make it work, I think, right. The trade-off in that is the the orchestration between the functions is just chaos for to get a full application. Let me, and I think that this goes back to, uh, and now I'm almost going to quote at least the meaning of what John was saying the other day mm -hmm. is we are not ready for that, the, the reality. No. So I, I do tend to think I, I think that I'm forward thinking and trying to push people to be beyond where they are. And that's the maybe the cause of disagreement uh, I had with John. But I think that the world is not yet ready, is struggling to understand the concepts of microservices. Uh, and when I say understand, I mean beyond I'm doing it, but I'm really doing it. <laughs> uh, you know, I see microservices being in a monorail repo and undeployable uh, separately and God knows. Uh, so I think that we are not, did not yet master microservices. And for that means that automatically I discard functions as, yeah. and, and as an option. Yeah. And most people that I see that are doing quote unquote microservices tend to deploy to mule most of the time. That's the one that I see the biggest deployment target. Yeah. And I cannot think of a, anybody that's using Mule that isn't using Spring Boot as their as their development tool for that or development language. So to believe that you could take Spring Boot and go serverless, you're fooling yourself. If you've never written any kind of, whether you've done Lambda or Azure Functions, you're not going to be using Boot for that. You're going to be locked into a specific way that they say it needs to be written. But the beyond whether you can let's say that you can do it and you want to do it i'm still kind of is that that such increasing complexity is it worth it now people ask me the same thing for microservices and i say i think it's worth it in many use cases not always but the inc increased complexity around microservices decreases some other uh, complexities I, I tend to believe that often microservices are worth it but then if I go further into extreme, let's say the functions, and uh, that, that might be too much. Yeah. The, the, the concept of serverless is good. From, at least let's, let's talk about it from a deployment strategy. That's near perfect. Yeah. Let's say you're, you're deploying, if, if you're doing serverless, what I consider correct, which is basically you're just deploying a function, right? You, you, we we semi-disagree agree on that. But if it's just that one function that's being deployed, then the only problem you're ever going to have, you have to trust that your serverless platform knows how to deploy correctly. Yeah. Whatever that correctly is, basically, it's not going to drop anything. Uh, that That is perfect, but at what cost? I mean, serverless, you got cold boot, you got, you name it, you got it. There's lots of things you just don't know about because it's so far abstracted. Yep. Which then now, so let's, let's say that that's one of the most far extremes. We've got blue, green, old school way, the most other extreme. And now you got Kubernetes probably somewhere at about the 75% part of that curve, right? You, you, you have bad blue, green, then you've got reasonable blue, green, then you've got Canary, then you've got Kubernetes and then you got serverless. Does that seem like a reasonable continuum? Uh, more or less, except that I think that Canary and then other types of rolling updates or progressive uh, deployment okay, also not. Yeah. I think that they are, that Kubernetes is not coming after that. I think it's enabling them or making them reasonably yeah, cause easy. Yeah, because Kubernetes isn't a deploy st deployment strategy. Yeah. I just couldn't think of the right word that would align with that. 
So, uh, but serverless, yes, I think that serverless comes after rolling updates. Not as replacement, but in evolution of how we think, yes. Is that it? Yeah, we've talked, so. we've, we've talked for 30 minutes, so it seems like we've... That's probably at least it for now. Let me summarize. I'm not saying... Yeah, don't, go, ahead, go ahead and summarize it, yeah. I'm not saying don't ever use blue-green. I'm just saying that very often it is a bad choice. Sometimes you think that blue-green means blue and then green, while it actually means blue and green at the same time. So if you can, if your architecture doesn't allow it, you cannot use it, so don't stop wasting your time thinking about it. And if your architecture does allow it, then actually there are better ways to do it, like rolling updates, uh, canaries, progressive deployment, I mean, many different concepts. Think of it, think of blue, think of blue green as being the first iteration of the concepts around progressive delivery. Hmm. That sounds tweetable right there. Say it one more time. Do you remember what you just said? I'm not sure. Uh, okay, that's fine. We'll look, we'll go back and look at it. Um, it's okay. It's it's uh, it's one of those days. And and now I just realized that I'm in trouble. Every once in a while, I meet Martin, uh, and he's not gonna like what. But he's probably not listening to this, so we're okay. Do you refer to him as Martin or as Mr. Fowler? Uh, as Martin, and he doesn't like that. He likes being referred in by his last name. <clears throat> Okay, let's move on, because um, we we need to keep people semi happy. Uh, all right, so that's that's it for at least for today on this. Um, I'm sure some people have some interesting comments on this. John, if you're listening, I'm sure you have some too. Um, and I know you're listening, John. Thanks. And, but there's more people listening than John. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about this episode. You can reach out to us on the Slack channel or Slack team, DevOps20, that's DevOps, the number two and the number zero. You can sign up for a free account there if you don't have one already. Join the podcast channel, ask away your questions. Uh, if you want to ask your question, you can, uh, using your voice so we can play it back, uh, you can leave us a voice message using Voxer. Uh, you can sign up for a free personal account at Voxer and then add DevOps Paradox as a contact and then just leave us a message. And if you're listening via Apple Podcast. Which, if you're, let's see, when will this come out? This is scheduled to come out probably the second week of October. So by that time, is that when the new iOS is out? I think it is. I don't remember. I've lost track. I'm still one of the few people who actually use iPhones. Um, anyway, Apple Podcasts. It's not going to be called iTunes anymore. It's going to be Apple Podcast, even on Catalina which now I have to buy a new hardware so I can install Catalina because I don't have any hardware that I can actually install Catalina on. Um, anyway, if you're listening via Apple podcast, please consider leaving a rating and review. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. There's links to the Slack workspace, the Voxer account and how to leave a review in our description down in the show notes. Uh, we'll go ahead and mention the books here. Well, if you haven't bought a copy of DevOps paradox yet, or, the latest toolkit book 2.6, uh, buy it and expense it. Uh, don't just buy it for yourself. Or if you're going to buy it for yourself, that's great. But then have somebody else buy some more and expense it that way too. So that's deployment strategies in a nutshell. Blue green still may be where you have to go for today. If you can get to Canary, great. And on down the line. I suspect that this will produce negative comments from lots of people. So please put them in somewhere. Yes. Uh, I know that either you're too shy or I know that whenever I speak about that with people, it, it, it creates emotional reaction. Is that before or af after adult beverages? During. During. Is that it? Are yeah, we done? I think we are. Okay. All right. So if you, if you if you have some great hate mail for us on deployment strategies, uh, please send it to us. Oh, also our email addresses are down below in the show notes as well. Send us an email. That's fine. We'll take that too. Thanks again for listening to episode number twenty four of DevOps Paradox.